Hi, this is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of September 9th, 2019. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on Facebook Live and via streaming audio from the show's website weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael on Tuesdays from 6.20 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, and SoundCloud pages, and on my website at bgkeithley.com. You can find past episodes of the Weekly Top 3 also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, During the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, why, even if the administration achieves its goal next year for spending cuts, we still will be talking about more PFD cuts. Second, what the permanent fund's continued strong returns mean for the current generation. It's not everything you would hope. And third, our takeaway from the Fitch bond ratings downgrade, it's not the cuts, it's the unstable revenue sources we're relying on. And now, let's join Michael. Let's talk about the um, the weekly top three. And in fact, I think that uh, uh, you kind of are hitting some of the things that I got a chance to, to espouse on a little bit yesterday although we focused more on national stuff yesterday for the first time in forever. But let's talk a little bit about this, um, you know, what what's to come. The internal memo suggests that we've got more in the wind. I know Donna Arduin has been on the program before to talk about, you know, this is kind of phase one of a multi-phase approach. And that has come out now, and it seems like people like the ADN and others are shocked, just shocked, I tell you, that he would even consider even more cuts, even though we're still at a $600 million deficit. Um, give us, uh, you know, give us some idea where you think we're headed from here. Well, Michael, this is going to be this is going to live up to your 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 description of this segment as as down in the weeds. But but we need to get down in the numbers to sort of understand uh, what we're doing here. Um, we we these numbers are going to show how deep a hole we're in. We made some progress last year uh, with uh, this past session with with cuts. Uh, we cut spending from about 4.8, uh, depending upon how you treat one line item, to about 4.2 uh, billion. So about 600 million uh, in cuts, uh, a pretty good progress. But uh, when you look at at how deep the hole is, uh, that's only sort of like a down payment, and and not a very big down payment at that. Focusing on the agency operations budget, uh, which is what uh, the internal memo that the ADN reported on uh, talks about. Uh, of that $600 million in cuts, about $250 million of that was in agency operations. So we cut agency operations by about 6.5% uh, uh, this year. To get to, the fifth, to get to the 15% over two years that the internal memo uh, is talking about, we need to cut another $340 million uh, next year uh, to achieve that 15%. Now, think about that for a moment. Out of the agency operations budget, we cut about $250 million this past year. We need to not only do that, but we need to increase that level of cut uh, by about 30% in order to achieve that, that 15% uh, reduction uh, that uh, that the that the memo is talking about. That's that's a, I mean, when you think about all of the all the all of the issues that we went through this past year with the university K through 12, uh, Medicaid, uh, and and out of that we got about 250 million dollars. Think about what we're going to have to go through uh, to get to get another 340 million dollars. Uh, out of those, out of those same categories, it's going to be K through 12. I mean, that's the only place since we've locked in the university, um, and since we are, uh, we're sort of fighting the battle on Medicaid. The only place left to go that has any material amount of dollars in it is K through 12. Um, and so, 340 million dollars out of out of all of agency operations, 
but the bulk of that having to come from K through 12 because we can't go back to the university again. Um, we've already locked in that amount. That's that's a huge, huge battle. Even that though. Uh, doesn't get us, even fighting that battle and getting to the 15, 15% reduction doesn't get us to, uh, doesn't get us a balanced budget uh, next year. Right. We will have, at the end of that, if we make the 15% reduction, we'll have about a $3.8 billion uh, uh, budget uh, all in uh, operating in capital, but we only have revenues next year, projected revenues of $3.3 billion. And that, that includes that includes the remaining portion of the POMV that's not that, that that doesn't go to statutory dividends. So we have about a five. Even after all the battle that we're talking about going through to get that 15% reduction, we still have about a 500 million dollar, a half a billion dollar uh, deficit uh, at the end of at the end of next year. Uh, then <laughs> and, and, now, and so now you know how do we, how do you deal with that? Right. Uh, and and the memo talks about, or the governor's talked about, and Don has talked about a three-year plan now uh, it, uh, to, to achieve these reductions. Well, revenues are falling away again in FY22, uh, FY22. Um, and in order to, to in order to achieve uh, a balanced budget at the end of that three years, you have to make another 800 million dollar reduction. Uh, uh, on top of the reductions that you've gone through this year, and then the, and then the three hundred forty million dollar reduction you have to make uh, next year. All told, by the end of FY22, if this is a three-year plan, by the FY, by the end of FY22, we have to make roughly a thirty-six percent cut. Uh, we 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 need to have made roughly a thirty-six percent cut in in spending UGF spending from where we started at FY19. To where we end up at the end at the end of FY22, and and I you know theoretically that's possible, but come on, uh, we see what we've gone through uh, just to get the the cuts that we made uh, this past year. To to think that we're going to be able to do 130 percent the same level plus 30 percent um, to get to the 15 percent goal in FY21 is a stretch to think that we're going to have to that we're going to layer in an additional uh eight uh, uh an additional reduction of 800 million dollars in fy22 to finally get to this balanced budget is just i mean that's 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 theoretically possible but but realistically we're not going to achieve that so it's i mean the 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 the, the reductions that the administration making are is making are appreciated uh, they are hard fought. Uh, we certainly uh, support them uh, in that. But the level, the, the hole that we've started out in uh, is just huge. Basically, that's all to say that that we're, we're going to continue to talk about as long as we as long as we focus only uh, on balancing this budget on the backs of of middle and lower income Alaska families through PFD cuts. We're going to continue to be talking about that. Uh, next year and, and the and the year after, even with the 15% cuts, we still have, as I said, a half a billion dollar deficit in FY21, um, and and the additional uh, reductions that we have to make in FY22 are unrealistic, and people are going to continue to talk about PFD cuts. This this debate uh, is far from over. Let's uh, <clears throat> let's get let's break it backwards to, to just brass tacks for a second, Brad. Could the state live within its means? I mean, it seems like everything you're saying there, based on the fact that we're, revenues are continuing to decline and everything else, uh, I mean, is it possible? I mean, would we pro be providing, in your mind anyway, uh, all the required state services and everything else and still be able to live within our means um, in the long run? Well, there's two, there's two uh, pieces to that question. One is, um, can we theoretically do it? And the answer to that is yes. I mean, I, I can, we can, anybody can run numbers that shows the reductions that, that need to be made in order to live within our current means. And by current means, we need, we mean oil revenue, the other, other taxes we've collected, plus the, 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 the leftover portion of the POMV after the statutory dividend. Yes, you can run, you can run spreadsheets that show that, that, that that's achievable. The question is whether it's politically achievable, um, and and whether there is the will in the legislature 
to 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 make those cuts themselves, or at a minimum, to back up the governor with 16 votes uh, if the governor makes those through vetoes. And what we've seen this past session is the will is not there. Even in the Republican minority, the will is not there. The reason the governor's second round of vetoes are, are were lower than the first round of vetoes, which in fact were lower uh, than the reductions he wanted to make originally in the initial budget. Uh, the reason we've ended up we ended up with the deficit this past year is because he he didn't have 16 votes in the legislature to uphold this the second time around the level of vetoes he had made the first time around and he didn't have 16 votes the first time around to uphold a level of cuts uh, that that he'd made in the initial budget it's it, it's simply that the, the there's there's too many constituencies out there that can bring pressure even on the Republican minority that can bring pressure on the Republican minority to restore uh, their cuts. I mean, the one that we've talked about on previous shows and the one that just stands out to me is the Arts Council. Uh, uh, we were, he restored the Arts Council uh, in the second round of vetoes. It's only $700,000, but it's hugely, hugely uh, symbolic. Um, he restores that the Arts Council in the second round of vetoes because he didn't have 16 votes uh, to uphold it in the Republican minority. So theoretically, yes. Yeah, we can make these cuts all day. I mean, I, I, I've i got spreadsheets, you know, that, that, that go days. on for pages. Right. I've seen some of them. Spreadsheets for days. Pages. Yes, that's, I see spreadsheets for days. That's Brad right there. That, that, that show how you do that. But the political will. Uh, to do it uh, is is just not there, Michael. And and you know we, we talk about replacing legislators in the next in the next round. And yes, we need to do that because we can make deeper cuts with 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 other with with a different set of legislators than we've made with this set of legislators. But even then, if you can't get if you right now can't get 16 to uphold getting you down to uh, getting you down to where you need to go. Uh, even with uh, additional legislators, uh, you're not going to right-thinking legislators. You're not going to you're not going to be able to, to eliminate the eliminate the deficit entirely. Brad Keithley is our guest, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Um, Harold makes a valid point in the chat room talking about you. You mentioned the education. We've argued for years that the education formula needs to be opened up, and we need to be talking about that for sure. He says that the education formula weighs close to $400 million annually, supporting 54 overhead departments, which are, of course, the various school districts, which could all be consolidated. But even in that $400 million was all taken back up, what you're saying is in the following year, there's still not enough money to cover the overhead when it's all said and done. Yeah, it's uh, it's just, I mean, we we have built a hugely deep hole. Uh, in terms of the structure of the government, uh, the structure of government services that we've got now, and we've created um, uh, so many constituencies that that support that. I mean, I I, I can't imagine can't imagine the kind of battle we're going to go through to K twelve in K twelve to, to to achieve the three hundred forty million dollars uh, in additional reductions we need this coming year to get to the fifteen percent uh, objective. Um, uh, we, we've just built up a, a huge number of constituencies that, that, you know, we, we will slog through some of that, but I think, I think we've seen this last session. You're not going to get 16 for, for all that you need. Yeah. What about the huge payment Greg says due for the crazy retirement program for the state employees? That's the elephant in the room. We haven't even really touched on. I mean, that's all that money's coming due over the next five years and uh you're going to start seeing those payouts go down i mean that that is that's not even hardly in the equation at this point right brad well we've got it into we've got it in our spreadsheet on on the operating budget i mean there's been projections i think they grow at something like four and a half percent uh uh annually uh the purse terms payments grow at four and a half percent annually over the next uh over the next 10 years uh, and that's certainly adding to the problem. I mean, um, you, you've got to, you've got to not only, so, so that's a given state debt is a given. Those are, those two are pretty well locked in. We're not going to default on our debt uh, and we have a constitutional obligation to pay PERS and TERS, at least under the current interpretation of the constitution, we have an obligation to pay PERS and TERS. Um, and, and so those two are pretty well locked in. That means that you've got a limited number of other places to, to, to take, uh, to take the cuts, you've got to 
even even to keep it inflation, you've got to cut everything else back more than uh, by more than inflation uh, in order to in order to pay the PERS and TERS and the and state debt. Um, but uh, yeah, it's it's PERS and TERS increases the increases the amount of the problem. But even if PERS and TERS wasn't there, we would still still have a deep problem. But it certainly adds to the problem because it's there. <laughs> You just said something interesting that I'm going to ask you to expound upon. Based on the current interpretation of the Constitution to say that we have to pay it, are you thinking that somebody's going to try and reestimate that or re, re, redo that opinion? What I mean, I'm, I, see, I hear lawsuits jingling in the background here. What, what, what are your thoughts on that? Well, so California has <clears throat> had a couple of cases. There are a lot of states that are confronting uh, the 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 commitments they made, the retirement commitments they made to, to public employees, um, and 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 it's driving a lot of states uh, to the edge, if not over the edge. And there is there is mounting litigation going on in the lower 48, in other states, uh, challenging the state's obligation to make those payments. Some of them have provisions that look like ours. Some of them. It's it's somewhat easier to make changes going forward. They don't have the same sort of provisions. Ours probably is at the at the mo more extreme because we've got it in the Constitution, uh, language in the Constitution that looks like it's supposed to do that. But there's some cases working their way through out there that 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 would in some other states uh, result, if successful, would result in interpretations that would potentially apply to Alaska and potentially uh, create the opportunity for litigation up here to to challenge PERS and TERS. Um, Plus, uh, you know, there's the, we've got the state has some ability <laughs> at the expense of the local governments, but the state has some ability to reduce uh, the percent of obligations that it's paying out of its pocket. The TERS obligations are run up by, and a portion of the PERS uh, are run up by local government. I mean, the teachers are, are local government employees. Um, the state's paying a portion, a significant portion of that retirement. The state could say, uh, that we're going to shift a portion of that burden. We're not going to pay all this burden anymore. At the state level, we're going to shift a portion of it to the to the local government. That doesn't make the dollars go away, but at least it shifts them away from the state, and the state could reduce it in that fashion. So there, there's ways that uh, the state might be able to reduce its obligation either outright to the retirees if the if the lower 48 litigation sort of goes in a certain way and would be applied to Alaska, or the state can can reduce its obligation somewhat by shifting it to local government. You, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> you uh, were just talking about uh, uh, you know the the overall the overall look at, at the way money is going to happen and and the fact that we need to change out legislators and and all that stuff, but. It doesn't sound like you're super hopeful that even if we changed out all the legislators, this is going to, you know, that this is really going to happen. Do you see a way out of this without us having to, I mean, this this whole thing appears to be moving in the direction of having to find new sources of revenue. we got about a minute and a half here. Any any thoughts on whether or not that's actually doable without having to form some kind of new revenue? Changing out legislators will reduce the amount of new revenue. It will it will make the reductions that the governor is able to make uh, go deeper uh, before he sort of hits that level where he can't get 16 anymore. Um, but I don't see, I mean, if he can't get 16 out of the current legislature, uh, uh, you'd ha uh, then I don't see a way, even with the addition of additional legislators, where, where he's going to be able to get 16 to go below a certain base. I mean, you'd need 16 David Eastmans basically, um, to support that. But as long as your 16 is composed in part of Sarah Rasmussen's and and others who sort of, and, and Lance Pruitt's who say, ah, I can't go that far, um, then you're not going to, you're not going to be able to make deeper cuts. I, it's, a, it's a matter, it's a, it's a matter of degree. I don't think, honestly, looking at the numbers, I don't think we get out of this hole on, okay. a, on a cuts only <clears throat> basis. This leads us on to number two, which uh, was in a, which was a piece in the ADN talking about the permanent fund growing despite the fact that we'd spent billions on state services. Oh, and we'd spent on the dividend too, which again I took umbrage with. Uh, I think Brad may have a little bit of a different take on it, but feel free to uh, pontificate on that remark as well, Brad, on the way in. No, I, th I think you're right on the on the comment on the headline. I the 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 ongoing. I mean, the edit the, the editorial board of the Anchorage Daily News and the Fairbanks Newsminer have made clear 
their 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 thoughts, which is that the PFD ought to be cut, that the PFD state spending in it ought to be cut, and that ought to be sort of the first line of of generating new revenues by cutting PFDs. And the headline writers probably reflect the sentiment of the editorial board more than they reflect the, the sentiment of the stories. And I think you're you're very right to point that out. To me, um, this this article, I want to go off in a different direction with respect to this article. It's very good news. Uh, certainly, that the permanent fund uh, continues to make money, that they continue to make a strong uh, return on their investment. And it's very good news, even in an uncertain market that we've had the past year, uh, which has had certainly its highs and its lows, uh, that uh, that they had a, a positive uh, return uh, uh, this past year. But what this is pointing out uh, is is something that, that sort of goes back to the initial debates on POMV. Over the course of its history, uh, the the Permanent Fund Corporation has earned around a 6% uh, real rate of return. And, and real rate of return uh, means after inflation. Uh, it's real as opposed to nominal. It's an economic term. term. And real rate of re return means uh, means after inflation. And the, and the Permanent Fund Corporation, over the course of its history, has earned about a 6% re real rate of return. The uh, returns that it achieved this past year are, are sort of in line with that. Uh, they're a little below 6% real, uh, but but the market has been uh, uh, up and down in a way that, that makes that nevertheless a good number. Of that 6%, though, uh, 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 that 6% return, just keep that in mind for a second, what the statute provides, the POMV statute provides, is that we're only drawing out 5.25% currently um, and 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 moving to five percent um, uh, by in by in in, in 1920 yeah, in 2022, um, we're only drawing out that amount uh, of the six percent. We're leaving the remainder. Uh, re we're leaving the remainder in the permanent fund to keep the the permanent fund growing. That's that's really a question. I have a question about that, and it's a question that wasn't really debated very much, if at all, uh, when the POMV was adopted and these and these returns were adopted. What you're really doing is you're you're adding, you're leaving money in the permanent fund, uh, extra really extra money, uh, money that you've earned, uh, extra money in the in the permanent fund that will grow the the permanent fund for future generations. Um, it, additionally, on top of the contribution that's being made from royalties, this, the constitutional requirement to, to put royalties, a portion of the royalties in the permanent fund. So you're growing, you're growing the permanent fund for future generations, but you're really shortchanging in a way the current generation. If you were, if you were um, uh, really trying to treat all generations equally, you would, you would take the real rate of return each year. Uh, an average of the real rate of return, the, the normalized long-term real rate of return, and distribute it to the current generation, and then that would mean the same amount is in there for, after inflation, the same amounts in there for future generations. Basically, we're shorting the current generation um, and, and, and leaving more money in there for future generations, which future generations no doubt will appreciate. But what we're doing in shorting the current generation is, is especially now that we've gone to using a portion of of the draw for government, we're shorting government uh, uh, relative to future generations. We're taking less for this generation and leaving more uh, for future generations. And that's creating additional budget pressures, right? Because we're not getting, we're, we're, we're getting less than our generational share um, out, of, out of the permanent fund, uh, creating a bigger deficit and creating more pressure on cutting the PFDs or, or, or creating or, or generating uh, uh, or having to generate other sources of new revenue. So this is a great story. It's a great story in terms of the permanent fund continues uh, to earn money uh, even on, in challenging uh, economic times. It's a, it's a great uh, story for the permanent fund. It, it tends to make you think they're doing, the permanent fund corporation is doing a great job. But there's a big question when you, when you see it grows for future generations, that's really, it's growing for future generations at the expense of the current generation. To some degree, we're treating future generations, future Alaskans better in terms of how we're, how we're dealing with the permanent fund 
than we're treating the current generation. It's not a, it, it, uh, it, this is about a third order debate. It's a, it's a debate we need to get back to at some point. Uh, but I, I continue to have concerns about the POMV rate, uh, the POMV draw rate, and whether we're treating this generation fairly compared to future generations, um, and whether we can't step up the POMV draw rate uh, a bit and, and allow this generation to draw, to, to, to have the same draw out of the, after inflation, the same draw out of the, out of the permanent fund as future generations uh, are having. Maybe we get to get a chance to get to this debate after we've figured out the the uh, the uh, the PFD valuation, and we stop kicking that ball around for a little bit. Maybe we can get to that. I, I don't know at this point. Um, Jamie says, "Seems like Brad is starting to sound like the big money legislators wanting to pull more from the POMV." Your point is is that the POMV can still remain strong and still continue to grow the fund, but that we should be taking a little bit more than what we are set to take, so that we're not putting the burden on the backs of all Alaskans right now, not increasing yeah. some kind of taxation, right? Yeah, exactly right. I mean, the PO, what I'm saying is the POMV, we can, we can, we can have a little bit of more of a draw on the POMV uh, and, and, and still be fair to, to future generations. We're not, this generation's not taking what it could uh, out of the POMV. And that translates into when you have spending levels like we have, not taking what you can out of the POMV translates into PFD cuts or other taxes. So if we increase, increase this generation increase POMV draws to something that's more equitable compared to future generations, we could reduce the pressure on the PFD cuts and we could reduce the pressure on, on, on future taxes. Well, we're hoping that some of this stuff gets addressed. The uh, the the K twelve has got to be uh, you know it's got to be looked at. That formula has got to be opened up and discussed. It's been the sacred cow, but you think that there was weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth before. Wait till he starts cutting into the K twelve, then it'll be a whole new ball game. I can guarantee you that. Um, it, you, you thought it was bad before with uh, all the hair pulling. Uh, now it's going to be, why do you want children to die? That'll be the next. That, I mean, that'll really, do you want children, you know what, you want a state full of children with no with no brains and, and you know, all knuckle draggers? That's kind of what it'll be. I can see it already. Let's take it on to number three, Brad. Number three has to do with our credit rating in the state. And there's a story in the Alaska Journal of Commerce talking about Fitch downgrading us. Uh, it is a problem, you say, but it's both the governor and the legislature that are to blame. Let's so uh, we got about four minutes here. Um, so the the Fitch did downgrade us again. It's not it's not the end of the world. I mean, we're still well in Alaska, still well in investment grade. Uh, there are other states that are far worse off uh, than we are. It seems like we've been on. It seems like we've we've done a dive. Uh, in the ratings uh, because we started off so high. We started off with the highest rating uh, in the nation that we had earned when when oil production was high and oil prices were high and we were sort of rolling in money. Uh, what's happening happening with these downgrades is we're sort of coming back down to earth. Uh, we're coming back down to uh, a, a ratings level that, that, that sort of reflects where our economy is now, better reflects where our economy is now, and is not that different uh, than than other states that fund themselves uh, in other ways. A lot of people have tried to blame this on the governor. Uh, Fitch did talk about, in the downgrade, did talk about cuts uh, to the university um, and, and cuts elsewhere as being part of the calculation uh, in, uh, in the, uh, in, in, as a reason for the, uh, uh, as a reason for the downgrade. I think, though, it's 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 attributable to both the governor and the legislature and our failure to get a permanent solution, a long term solution to our fiscal situation. We're sort of we're sort of going from year to year on an ad hoc basis, trying to figure out how we're going to finance each year without without a long term view of sort of putting our putting our fiscal uh, house in order and and developing a consistent approach to how we're going to uh, pay for. Uh, government uh, going forward, how, how we're going to, what size of government we're going to have and how we're going to pay for it going forward. Until we get to that structure, that agreed structure, that permanent structure in place, we're going to continue to have these sorts of, of notes uh, from Fitch and from the other rating agencies uh, expressing concern and, and sometimes downgrading us uh, for, uh, for the failure to get our, to get our act together. It's not just the governor. 
uh, not just the governor's cuts that are causing the situation. It's the failure of the governor and the legislature to come together on a long-term fiscal plan that sets a that sets a structure in place that uh, that one can look at and rely on and say, okay, Alaska's got its fiscal uh, house back in order. Well, yeah. And Frank, <clears throat> and and it's again the previous administrations and previous legislators who have shoulder a lion's share of this blame uh, yep. in setting us up for this failure. Yep, I I, I agree with that. Um, and and we're not going to get to a permanent structure as long as we rely on as long as people continue to rely on, on PFD cuts to fund it because we're going to go through these annual debates about whether about the PFD level we have to get beyond that debate we have to agree on what we're going to do about it going forward I mean that's really the bottom line here Brad is that we were set up for failure on this by you know the past two administrations three administrations and the legislature of which a vast majority of the of the stalwarts who remain in the legislature were part of the problem to begin with uh and just again points us to the lack of foresight and vision from a lot of these people thinking that uh the gravy train would never end all those days of high cotton and and lots of money uh are now are now behind us and yet they refuse to acknowledge that you have to either pay for it some way or start to live within the means of what you do take in yeah, it's not just legislators. I mean, I, 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 I blame all of us, frankly. I mean, legislators in the in the in the late night in the late two thousands and the early uh, twenty teens uh, were responding to constituents. I mean, I remember when I wrote the first article, uh, my first uh, op ed piece on uh, we're spending too much. We need to cut the budget. I wrote it in October of twenty twelve. It was published in in Fairbanks and in Anchorage. I got all sorts of 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 crap about oh you're you're just a you know you're a nervous Nelly or you're Debbie Downer uh, we're gonna be we're gonna be fine uh, and 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 don't worry about it and people from that it, I, I remember uh, in the legislature of of 2013 2014 people kept saying we're gonna be fine we can continue spending we can continue building these football fields we can continue building the UAA athletic arena we I mean we we're we're gonna be fine um, and they were putting putting pressure on legislators, constituents were putting pressure on legislators to continue spending. I mean, the Matsu rail extension is another great example of, of you know, Matsu said, we need this rail extension. Um, and Matsu was even pressing for, for additional spending right. during that period. So it's not it's not just legislators. It, it's been the constituents that are pressing for it. And frankly, it's, it continues to be the constituents that are pressing for it now. The reason that, that Dunleavy couldn't get to 16 in the legislature to uphold the veto of the Arts Council is because a portion of that 16, he didn't have 16 that, that, that would agree that the Arts Council could be cut. There was a portion of the 16 that said, oh, no, we can, we need to continue spending on that. So, And they were doing it because their constituents were pressing them. So right. Although, it's, it's a, it, 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 there's, a lot of, there's a lot of blame to go around. But we're going to continue to have this situation. We're going to continue to have these downgrades and these questions from the rating agencies uh, until we get to a settled fiscal uh, structure going forward. And 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 the PFD needs probably needs to be part of that, but it can't be all of that because if we try to do it all on the backs of the PFD, we're just going to have year on year on year on year of debates about what the right PFD amount should be and whether we should follow the statute or not. Yeah. You can't blame me, Brad. I've been talking about this for years. It's not my fault, man. <laughs> I've been talking about this for years. Stop this spending madness. It is so frustrating because, I mean, again, you saw it. I saw it. Many of us were like, this just, this madness can't continue. And yet they just keep, they just keep going at it like it's going to last forever. I mean, and this is a, again, I talked about it yesterday. This is just a microcosm of what we're seeing on the national level. I mean, it's the same kind of thing. We can keep spending money we don't have. What do you mean it's going to, it'll never stop. We make the rules. Don't worry about it. Arithmetic doesn't matter. Yeah, and, and you know, for the past seven years, that we that worked for the state because we had savings uh, that we that we uh, slipped into to be able to, uh, to be able to cover it. But, um the savings are gone. Uh, we have to confront it. Uh, now we're into these de debates about the about the PFD, and we're going to continue to have these debates until we come to an agreed structure. I, one can be hopeful that that we're going to have an agreed structure uh, next year, but boy, when I try to say that on on Facebook or in speeches or or in conversations, I continue to get a lot of pushback about, oh, we can cut our way out of this. That's what the first segment was for. We can't cut our way out of this. The numbers are too staggering 
to be able to do that. And if you can't get 16 for what Dunleavy was trying to do this year, with even with the first round of vetoes, if you can't get 16 to uphold that and he has to back off on it on the second round of vetoes, we're not going to get there. For a six per, yeah, for a six percent cut, let alone having to take it upwards towards thirty percent. There's just the, the the likelihood of that happening is is becoming vanishingly small. Yep, absolutely right. Uh, Brad, yep. f- final thoughts: twenty seconds here, thirty seconds. <clears throat> well, we got to stay at it. I mean, we got to keep we got to keep pressing as we can, but we need to be realistic, and the realism should drive us to to working on a permanent fiscal solution. That, that has a portion funded from new revenues. There's just no way that we're going to be able to avoid that. Brad Keith Lee, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you, my friend. As always, it's a pleasure to speak with you. Michael, as always, thanks for having me. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the weekly top three from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube and SoundCloud pages and keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3.